Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues, friends. Uh, I hope you can hear us clearly. Uh, welcome to this first lecture of the year uh, for the AI4D community. Uh, I would alert you that this lecture is being conducted in both English and French, um, and we've provided some guidelines uh, to listening and participating in this lecture uh, in the Outlook invite. I hope you've been able to see that. Uh, at the bottom left of your screen, uh, you'll be able to toggle what language you would like to hear uh, this lecture in. Uh, and I would say if you're speaking, uh, we do have live translators on that are assisting us. Uh, so please try to speak uh, slowly or at, at a good pace so that they can keep up with that. Um, and so I hope everyone has a, a, has a, a good time. I am uh, sure this is not the first uh, and last uh, lecture that we'll be having. I'm sure we'll be having many, judging by the enthusiasm and, and uh, interest that has been shown uh, I'm sure that we'll be having many. I'm especially delighted to be introducing this one um, as we'll be hearing from two wonderful AI, AI professionals uh, from Responsible Artificial Intelligence Lab, uh, goes by rail, uh, and I will be introducing them in a minute. Uh, but I'm especially delighted because this is from my home uh, project within the AI4D community. So my name is Edmund Aperdoku. I'm with the Foundation for Data and Research. Uh, we're a social enterprise. We're based in Ghana and in other parts of the world. With me today from FDR is Anna Androsik, our eminent co-facilitator of the day. Uh, FDR has a strong standing in Ghana and Africa and our partnership with Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology started years back in gender and evaluation and in support of applied engineering work and partnering with the industry in Ghana in water, IT, and other sectors. In fact, some of our FDR members are graduates of KNUST. I would like to, at this point, uh, say a quick thank you uh, to our sponsors uh, from the Canadian-founded uh, IDRC. Uh, they've been wonderful and have been supporting us on this, uh, on the AI4D program. FDR supports IDRC in a project we're calling Supporting Artificial Intelligence Project, which is SAIL. So there's rail and then there's SAIL. And SAIL is supporting uh, a lot of these projects. And one of the important objectives of SAIL is to support the learning of our AI4D community. And, and so here I will now introduce rail and I'll introduce the speakers that we have on today's lecture. Rail is a multidisciplinary lab that focuses on building capacity in AI to respond to the developmental needs of the sub-region. RAIL seeks to be the first step in establishing a sustainable approach to nurturing local talent, to undertake research in responsible AI and innovation. RAIL has a solid drive to increase women in STEM participation through its various activities. The activities of this lab, RAIL, are specifically set to promote the digitization of products, processes, and services via innovative toolbox development for renewable energy, health, agriculture, and climate change, all based on uh, agenda equality and also uh, gender-based violence is part of the RAIL project. RAIL uses close collaboration with local, small and medium-scale enterprises and government bodies to 
uh, to uh, forward its objectives. We invite you to visit RAIL on their website, rail.knust.edu.gh for more information. Finally, I'd like to mention that we've sent uh, some technical uh, guidelines for you, like I mentioned earlier in the beginning of this uh, lecture. Uh, so please feel free to browse through that. And if you have any problems, please send a message and we do have support on the, on the, uh, on, on Kudo to, to help us. Finally, I would like to introduce our esteemed speakers for today. We have two speakers, Professor John Jerry Ponyo is a distinguished scholar and a principal investigator of rail and you will hear from him shortly. We also will have Dr. Henry Nono Mensa, the senior lecturer at KNUST in the computer engineering uh, department and he's also the programs coordinator of rail. At this point, I will pass you over to Professor Ponyo. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Edmond, for those words of introduction. Um, let me say a good morning to you wherever you are. And for those who are ahead of us, I say a good afternoon. Uh, we will want to have an interaction with you regarding a quantitative approach to measuring responsible AI. At this point, I will invite Henry to put up the slides so that I will do the first presentation and then Henry will come in to show us how we have used a tool that we developed here to quantitatively measure how responsible AI is. Uh, Henry, put up the slides, please. Okay. So I'm going to be doing a lecture on a quantitative approach to measuring responsible AI. Uh, let's move on to the next, uh, which talks about the outline. So in this presentation, I will take you through a tour, a brief about the KNUST, the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. We will look at industrialization in Africa. We will consider what opportunities AI offers as far as the African economy is concerned. Then we will look at uh, basically when we talk about real, who are we? Then we will go into the meat of the reason why we have gathered, why should artificial intelligence be responsible? We will look at what considerations should, uh, what, what should be our considerations as far as responsible AI is concerned. What are the key principles in responsible AI? Having introduced you to the key principles of responsible AI, we will now look at how do we quantify these key principles and how do we measure them from one initiative or one project to the other? I will introduce you to the tool that we have developed uh, within the AI for d setup, and then we will go on to conclude, after which Henry will come in and then demonstrate how this tool can be used wherever you are. Henry, let's move on. Okay, so when we talk of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Within Africa, we find ourselves in West Africa. Uh, we are in Ghana, which is in West Africa. And then when you come to Ghana, we are in the middle part of Ghana, in a, a, a city called Kumasi, which is the garden city of Ghana. Let's move on. Okay, so if you are in the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, as you enter, you will see uh, the symbol of a stool. A stool, those of you who are familiar with African culture, a stool is the seat for kings and queens. So what we are trying to say by having this at the entrance is that 
as you enter the university, you are trained to become an expert, a king and a queen in whichever area or whichever field that you find yourself. Additionally, what we want to communicate is that the university is embedded in rich African culture. Let's move on. Additionally, uh, one of the symbols of the university is the symbol of an eagle. And the reason why the eagle is important to us has to do with the vision of the eagle and the perception of the eagle. The eagle, far though it is in the sky, has the ability to perceive the tiniest of insects on the ground. What we represent as a university is the ability to train people to be attentive to detail and to perceive the deepest of thoughts. Let's move on. So in terms of uh, numbers we were established in 1951, became a full-fledged university in 1961. In terms of student numbers, we go beyond 84,000. We are governed around six colleges and an institute of distant learning. Let's move on. Henry, next slide, please. Okay, so now let's come to the various industrial revolutions that we have had. So uh, we began with Industry 1.0, uh, moved on to Industry 2.0. Industry 3.0 is when uh, computers started coming in, the digital revolution. Currently, we find ourselves in Industry 4.0. And the reason why this is important is that the World Economic Forum recognizes artificial intelligence as a key driver as far as the fourth industrial revolution is concerned. What we recognize is that irrespective of the potential that AI offers, there is a significant lack as far as capacity is concerned. And that is what we represent as far as building capacity to be able to bridge the gap. Let's move on, Henry. So what are the opportunities that AI offers globally? First and foremost, we recognize that in the health sector, AI has the, 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 the potential to revolutionize the health sector by developing tools that doctors and nurses can use in the various consulting rooms to improve healthcare. We also can apply artificial intelligence in the area of education. We recognize that currently self-learning is something that is trending. And with the help of artificial intelligence, we are able to increase our output as far as the educational sector is concerned. Food security is very key. And so in the area of agriculture and food security, AI can be applied. Once again, the World Economic Forum has said that applying artificial intelligence to the area of agriculture grants into trillions of dollars. And primarily what it means is that if we are able to position ourselves strategically and apply artificial intelligence to agriculture, we will be able to deal with the challenges that we have as far as food security is concerned. One other area that we can apply artificial intelligence is the area of transportation. Additionally, we also recognize that in the public sector, there is a lot of wastage. But if we are able to apply artificial intelligence to our public services, we become more efficient and become also effective in what we do. We can also apply artificial intelligence in the area of helping people who have a challenge or a disability in one form or the other. Henry, let's move on. And so what do we represent as far as the responsible artificial intelligence lab is concerned so in terms of our broader objective what we seek to do is to develop a long-term sustainable approach to nurturing local talent and as has already been said we recognize that artificial intelligence is a driver it is a key enabler as far as transforming the african economy is concerned but we also recognize that there is a significant lack as far as skills in that area is concerned. 
what we represent as the responsible artificial intelligence lab is to be the place where we can build capacity to bridge that gap so that we can have experts to drive the AI revolution within the African sub-region. Let's move on. And so the specific objectives, first and foremost, deepening our understanding of how to develop and apply responsible AI in the area of health, in the area of agriculture, in the area of um, energy and the likes. The second one is strengthening collaborations with uni between universities, uh, national and international collaborations with the private sector. Uh, currently in this meeting, there are people coming from different universities. There are people coming from various fields. What basically we want to do is to be able to foster collaboration so that we can create knowledge together and we can also be able to push the agenda together. Finally, we are not just interested in creating knowledge or generating solutions that are powered by AI. We are interested in the responsible use of technology. And so we want to be that voice that continues to encourage people as far as responsibly using artificial intelligence is concerned. We collaborate with uh, universities in Senegal and in Cape Verde as well. Let's move on. And so when you look at the responsible artificial intelligence lab, we have the main lab situated at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, where I am making the presentation from. But we have satellite labs in Senegal, in Cape Verde, and we have support labs in Germany and in other parts of the world. We want to encourage each and every one of you listening to us to come on board so that we can create knowledge together. Uh, Henry, let's move on. And so in terms of structure, if you come to the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, we have what we call the Research Hill, and uh, that is, uh, this is the postgraduate building. Inside the postgraduate building is where the real lab is. Let's move on. And so why should artificial intelligence be responsible? We are looking at why at all do we have to be responsible in the development of our solutions? The response to that is to ensure that AI solutions are delivered with integrity, equity, respecting individuals, and always being mindful of the social impact of what we do. What primarily this means is that there is the possibility that the technology can go wrong. There is the possibility that the AI can behave in a way different from its intended purpose. And that is the reason why we need to pay attention to making sure that the ultimate output of the solution is for the good of humanity and not for bad. And these considerations uh, tend to encourage the building of AI systems that are responsible and trustworthy to the point that we have subjected the solution to the rigor of making it responsible. It generates a lot of trust as far as its use is concerned. Let's move on. Okay, so what then should be the key considerations? If we want our artificial intelligence solution to be responsible, what should be the key considerations? The first consideration here has to do with fairness. The second one has to do with accountability. We are looking at equity. We want to look at the whole concept of data and privacy. We want to look at transparency as far as the solution is concerned the social and the environmental impact, and then ultimately safety. I'm going to pick one of them one after the other and try to explain. And then we will move on to how have we quantitatively measured each one of these principles. Henry, let's move on. Okay, so the whole concept of fairness. What we need to appreciate is that uh, real-time analysis of AI brings to life both intentional and unintentional biases. There is the possibility that based on the amount of data that is available, that biases can be introduced. But when there is a bias that has been detected, it behoves on the developer to ensure that biases are dealt with so that the solution is, 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 is not eventually biased in a way. And so what it means is we need to put measures in place to mitigate 
the level of bias. There is the possibility that we can eliminate bias completely, but as much as possible, we need to mitigate its effect and limit its eventual uh, influence as far as the ultimate uh, solution is concerned. And so, as much as possible, in creating fairness, we ensure that biases are eliminated to the barest minimum. Let's move on. Then there is the whole principle of accountability. What we need to appreciate is that we are training machines to think like human beings. We are training machines or, or, or computers to behave like human beings. What that means is that whoever is developing the AI must take responsibility as far as its output is concerned. And that is the reason why when solutions are developed, we need to be conscious of who do we hold accountable, who do we hold responsible as far as the eventual output of the solution is concerned. And so one must understand uh, uh, the national and international laws. What it means is that, for instance, if I am developing a solution and the solution is meant for a particular group of people to ensure that I am accountable, I should have taken into consideration all the laws and all the uh, cultural situations that exist within that environment so that the solution that has been developed will be responsible in its outlook. Henry, let's move on. Okay, so then there is also the whole issue about social and then the environmental impact. Uh, the, 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 let, let me put out a quote here. It says that if machines engage, if machines engage in human, uh, if machines engage in human communities as autonomous agents, then those agents will be expected to follow the community's social moral norms. A necessary step is enabling machines to do is to identify these norms, but whose norms are we looking at? So basically what we are saying here is that if we are going to be using the solutions within a certain environment and within a certain community, it is important that we are conscious of the environmental impact or the impact that these solutions will have on the people. If for instance, we are developing an AI solution that is intended to be used by children. It is important that we are conscious of the impact that it will have on the mental health of the children as they use it. We should not be driven by profit. We should not be driven by money to the point that we are not so conscious of the eventual impact that the solution will have on the social life of the people. What primarily this means is that we must pay attention to detail as far as the impact of our solutions will be on the environment and on society. And that is the reason why ethical considerations are important. When we develop solutions, it is important that it does not take people out of their jobs, but helps them be able to become more effective in the work that they do. Henry, let's move on. Okay, so then there is also the whole area of transparency and then explainability. The issue about trust is that to the point that people can understand the solution, to the point that they know the ins and outs of it, they are able to build trust. If we develop a solution to a group of people and they are not so they, they do not trust the solution, what it means is that all the investment that has gone into developing the solution will go down the drain because they do not trust the solution to use it. If we develop an AI that is to be used by agricultural farmers and the farmers do not understand the impact that such a solution will have on their yield and their productivity, at the end of the day, they will not use it and that will be money gone down the drain. What primarily that means is that we must involve the people right from the beginning and be very transparent as far as the, the solution is concerned so that we can build a lot of trust in the eventual use of the solution. Let's move on. Then there is the whole issue about data and then confidentiality. What we need to appreciate is that data is the blood that runs artificial intelligence. 
But as we gather data to train our models, it is important that we pay particular attention to the sensitivities of people from whom the data has been collected. When we have the permission to use data for a particular solution, it is important that we do not stretch it beyond what we have permission for. What that means is that where we are gathering data, there are privacy issues involved, and we must respect the dignity of man not to use the data beyond what is good for the people for whom the data has been collected from. And so confidentiality is important, and we need to be responsible in the use of the data as has been collected. Henry, let's move on. Then there is uh, finally the whole issue about safety, uh, security, and then robustness. When we develop solutions, the solutions must make life safer. If we are deploying a solution and it is going to be a danger to humanity, then such a solution is not for the good of man and must be stopped. And so we need to pay particular attention to how safe is the solution as has been deployed. Let's move on. And so we, we, well, what we have done is uh, to look at the responsible AI pipeline, beginning from the envisioning stage, going to the data gathering stage, using the data to train a model, and then deploying it. And so as we look at the AI, uh, responsible AI pipeline, at every stage, we ask key questions with reference to how responsible the deployment is or how responsible the solution is. So at the envisioning stage, at the data stage, at the modeling stage, at the deployment stage, we subject the solution to key principles to ensure that we are being responsible as far as the deployment is concerned. Henry, let's move on. Okay, so in doing this, we have given a quantitative view I'm very wait. sorry, Prof. The slides are not moving at our end. We cannot see them moving. Um, I can see them. Henry is the one changing them, but I can see them from my end. I'm getting messages from colleagues. The slides are not moving. Um, oh. Please move to the okay. next slide that you're discussing. Okay, Henry, let's try again. Move and let's be sure it's, it's moving. Moving now. I see it's moving. So colleagues, please. Okay. Move. okay, now people saying I can see them moving. So thank you very okay. much. Sorry for okay. Wonderful. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Anna. So Henry, let's go back. Let, let, let's go back to, um, let's go back one slide. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it, it, we are looking at a quantitative view to responsible AI. And why is this important? When we say that a solution is responsible, it doesn't have to be subjective. When we have two AI solutions, we should be able to subject them to some quantitative measure to be able to make a determination which of the solutions is more responsible than the other. And that is the reason why we are now looking at a quantitative approach as far as measuring responsible AI is concerned so that we limit the level of subjectivity in responsible AI deployment. Henry, let's go. OK. And so we are introducing the facet responsible AI framework, which actually gives us a tool through which we can measure how responsible our solution is. This has been the doing of the AI for D initiative. Three labs came together. Rail from KNUST, Citasel from Burkina Faso, and then the University of Dodoma, Tanzania came together to put these two together so that we can deploy it in our various um, uh, initiatives as far as AI is concerned. Uh, Henry, let's move on. Okay, so. In the FACET pipeline, um, as I have already indicated, we are looking at the various stages as far as the AI innovation process is concerned. So we are looking at the envisioning stage, we are looking at the data gathering stage, we are looking at the modeling stage, and then we are looking at 
the deployment stage. And at every stage, we subject it to key principles as far as responsible AI is concerned. Henry, let's move on. Okay, so um, at the envisioning stage, uh, what we consider is uh, the AI's fairness assessment, how inclusive the design has been, its sustainability, the ability to scale, and then commercialization. So primarily what it means is at the time when we are conceiving the idea to develop the AI solutions, we subject it to key considerations to ensure that indeed we have been responsible at the ambitioning stage. At the data modeling and then deployment sessions also, we try to measure how ethical and responsible the implementation has been. Let's move on, Henry. Okay, so um, what we have done also is to give scores to the various questions that we ask ourselves at the various stages as far as the development cycle is concerned. And then we subject it to a particular weight. Very soon, Henry will come in and then take us through an exercise where we subject this to a key solution to see how it has been. But as I've already indicated, we are looking at how fair it is, how accountable it is, the confidentiality, the ethics dimension, the transparency, and how safe it is. And so that gives us the fastest framework. And W gives us the weight. What is the weight that we assign as far as that particular framework is concerned? Let's move on. Henry, next slide, please. Can we move to the next slide, Henry? Maybe need to refresh button on the right. There is a possibility to refresh to see the slides. Yeah, no, uh, Henry dropped off. He's coming back online. Um, OK, sorry. OK. Uh, OK. Slides are on. All right, yes, Henry. Let, let, let's move on to the next slide. And OK, so thank you. So in, in uh, quantifying what measure we put on each of the key considerations as far as the development cycle is concerned, as I did indicate, we have the ambitioning stage, we have the data stage, we have the modeling stage, and we have the deployment stage. What we have proposed is that at the ambitioning stage, all the key questions that are asked sum up to a 30% as far as the responsible AI score is concerned. When it comes to the data gathering stage, we put 20%, the modeling stage 25%, and then the deployment stage 25%. One of the key reasons or considerations that went into putting 30% for the ambitioning stage is that that is where most of the thinking is done. If we get it wrong right from the beginning, when we are moving on, the solution that we de deploy may not be good enough. And so we ensure that at the ambitioning stage, we put a lot of premium on that. Henry, let's go. OK, so uh, what, what we have done is that at the ambitioning stage, there are key questions that we ask. For each of the questions, there is a weight that we give based on um, the answers that are given. So in terms of fairness, in terms of accountability, in terms of confidentiality, in terms of ethics, and in terms of safety, depending on the answers that are given to questions that are asked, a particular score is given. 
And then at the end of the day, we put all of them together to get the overall score as far as that particular solution is concerned. I won't spend too much time on this because Henry will come in and then demonstrate it for us. Henry, let's move on. Okay, just, just move on. So this also gives us for the data stage and then we have exactly. So in developing this solution, what we have done is to compare this framework with existing frameworks and look at what ours considers that the others do not consider. So for instance, the FACT framework, um, the ambitioning is not uh, scored but data modeling and then the deployment stage is taken into consideration. For the Microsoft Fairness Checklist, we have the ambitioning taking care of, data taking care of, modeling taking care of, but the deployment stage is not scored. For the uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers Responsible AI Toolkit, uh, none of them is, is, is considered. For ours, we have all the various stages from the ambitioning stage to the deployment stage, all of them have been considered. Henry, let's move on. Okay, so uh, as I bring this to a close, what I can say is that these considerations tend to provide an objective and fair assessment of AI innovations in the research labs. So where we have various researchers working on AI projects, we can subject whatever they are doing to this uh, tool or this framework so that it gives us a very good measure whether the solution that we are deploying is responsible or not. It brings out areas that uh, our various AI team need to focus on and improve to make their solutions responsible and trustworthy. So primarily what it means is that from the ambitioning to the deployment stage, when you score, the possibility is that at the ambitioning stage, not much attention was paid to detail and your score may be a little lower. It only gives us an awareness to pay attention to certain things that we have ignored so that we can improve upon the solutions that we have deployed. This evaluation tool, as I did indicate, is available on the real website. What we have actually done is to create a tool online so that depending on what it is that you are doing, you go online and then you ask a few questions and then it scores you naturally so that you can take a decision as to whether the solution that you are deploying is responsible or not. At this point, I will bring the uh, lecture to an end and then Henry will come in and then pick a typical example and then run this uh, tool by it so that we can have a very good idea how to use the tool. Thank you very much. Henry, you can take over. OK, so uh, this is where you can find us as real, yes. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Okay, yeah, so um, I just want to share my screen. Um, if you can see. Oh, okay, so please, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see. Go ahead. Okay, okay, sure. Um, so, um, as um, Prof. Um, Konyo has um, rightly said, um, this particular session is basically to look at a typical use case. And um, in this um, case, we are going to be looking at the um, chat GPT, which is a very popular AI um, application or platform that um, has received a lot of attention and a lot of hype. So we want to actually um, use the facets to, in a way, assess um, how responsible that um, application is based on um, some information that we have on the chat um, GPT. Okay, so this is going to be the, the overview of the presentation. We'll look at the facets. I think um, Prof. Konyo has um, um, really treated that um, into detail, so I might have to 
um, move fast when we get there. Then the actual evaluations, the, um, the questioning and um, um, the um, answers we chose and also um, the reasons behind the options that um, we've, we've, we've selected. Then um, finally, we would use the tool to do the scoring and um, based on the output of, of, of the scores that um, we see um, coming out from the, the, the framework, where we can um, conclude on that. Okay. So um, this is, is, is well known, the facet framework, as um, Prof. Konyo has rightly said, it's, it's um, mainly interested in these principles as the fairness, accountability, confidentiality, ethics, transparency, and the safet, um, safety. And um, it's made up of um, four pipelines. That's um, the envisioning, the data model, and the deployment. So um, this um, next slide, this is showing us the address. So um, you, can, you can have access to um, the framework, the FACES framework from our homepage. We have a link from our homepage to the website. You can also access it directly also using this um, um, URL, that's the facets.netlify.app. Um, that's, that's where we are currently um, hosting the, the, the app. So once you visit this um, website, you just see something like the image um, on your is it right. And um, you can click on the calculate the facet score um, to start the whole assessment process. So it's, it's um, a very simple to, um, tool to, to use and um, everything is, is quite self-explanatory. So um, this interface you see on the right um, is, is showing you the actual assessment um, um, portal where, um, as um, was earlier mentioned, you are asked a number of questions. And based on the questions, you provide um, um, relevant um, answers um, to these questions. And based on that, the system does the score. Um, we'll go through the, the actual thing on the, um, the platform. So I'll just um, move on from, from here. Okay. Yeah, so um, when we get to the envisioning stage, there are a number of questions. Um, and um, the first question under the envisioning stage when it comes to the chat GPT was, um, have you considered the system's purpose um, including critical objectives and intended um, uses or applications? Um, the answer was yes, because um, when we, we, we went through the chat GPT um, website and blogs, um, we were able to find out that yes, um, the, the, the objectives were quite explicit and um, the intended usage too was also quite explicit. And um, for the second um, question, which is, do you think using AI aligns with your organization or community value? Um, the answer was also yes. Um, the reasons um, have been given um, to why um, we, 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 we made that um, choice, that looking at the, the principles, they outlined some long-term um, benefits. So, um, looking at the cooperative mindset that um, they want to um, provide. Yes, so these are, these are all things that are there. And um, for um, taking into consideration specific um, ethical considerations re relating to the use of AI before developing an AI um, solution. Um, I think the, the answer, what we found out was no, um, and the explanation being that here, um, some pressing ethical issues that um, affect GPC has to do with some um, privacy bias and also um, environmental impact. We'll get to see that in subsequent, explan more explanations on that in subsequent um, um, questions that might pop up because we couldn't find too much information on there which could help us um, choose um, a positive response for, for, for this particular 
um, say. And um, we also realized that um, even though like people um, had the opportunity of, of, of deleting um, very sensitive um, inputs or sensitive um, data that they, they put on the website or whatever data that they put on the website, it's actually being used for their training purposes or for research purposes because it's a, um, it's a research preview. Yeah, so that's, that's one thing. Then um, when it comes to the next question, which is um, having taken um, a specific account of um, algorithmic biases um, of the envisaged um, AI solution, here we, 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 the answer was yes, because at least um, they put in some um, um, procedures or um, to safeguard some biases in there. And this being the envisioning stage, it's, it's, it's uh, worth mentioning that, okay, it's at this point that all these um, considerations came up, right? Because you see that when you ask questions, when it has to do with um, um, racism and all that, um, it it's, has its own way of telling you that, oh, okay, with this particular type of question, I'm not able to respond to that part, type of question. But um, if you put it in a different context, yes, we, we also realize that it's able to, to um, um, respond to those um, comments. Right, so this in the first place being an envisioning um, stage, uh, we thought that okay, fine. Once they've put in these measures, um, it's it's all had to um, be taken at the um, the planning phase, and it's it's was in the right direction, even though it wasn't the best. Um, and also, um, when you look at um, their um, how they looked at um, bringing all stakeholders or are trying to identify various stakeholders, also those demographic groups in terms of race, gender, disability status, and all that. Um, we realized that they, they, they tried to make conscious efforts to um, try and cover and, 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 and plug most um, um, biases or cover a lot of um, demographic groups but these um, groups, not all the groups were, were, were captured in there. Yes, and then when it comes to um, um, the issue of, um, let's say, um, identifying a bias, there's also um, provision being made for um, a moderation API, um, which can help um, um, people or users report um, issues or flag issues that can be looked at in, um, in future trainings. So this is also something in the, the right direction. So the next question also had to do with um, how they've envisioned whether the system or activity would impact human rights. Um, that was also answered as yes, because one of their principles is to develop systems that are beneficial to all, which is uh, uh, boldly um, seen on the um, the websites and all that. And um, here we also realized that um, they've tried to put in some um, measures or some some um, tools that at least um, will be able to help them um, remove um, discriminatory um, elements from um, the, um, the the platform and all that. And I think it's it's, it's a step in the in the right direction. Okay, and um, the next question has to do with um, um, if they've considered how to track and mitigate the effect of their system on the environment. Um, we realized that that was no because um, um, with what we what we saw, right, we didn't really see much information reporting. Um, let's say. Um, the, the, the power or how the, the effect of the training um, of their model on the environment, we really didn't see that and that wasn't recorded. So um, it gives us the impression that they um, were not too keen about the, um, the impact on the environment as, as, as opposed maybe other ethical considerations and all that. Yes, and um, 
when we also look at the next um, question, whether they've envisioned um, the system having sensitive, some premature adversarial use of um, their platform, um, the response was yes, because we realized that, okay, they had also put in measures, just as um, we said with the moderation API to make sure that, okay, users can flag um, malicious users of the, of the um, or malicious out, outputs, malicious inputs. Yeah, so it means, it means they, 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 they sat down and knew that people can in turn use this application for, for um, purposes that were not actually um, part of the original intent um, for the platform. And um, the next question and the envisioning also had to do with um, if they were able to identify subject matter aspects and engage them during the, sub, um, the system envisioning process. And um, looking at the fact that um, the OpenAI um, company, um, which is, is, is um, one of the leading companies when it comes to um, AI solutions um, globally, um, they have um, experts, they have people with um, the relevant skills to be able to um, contribute to the um, this development process. Yes. So, and also um, from the fact that um, ChatGPT is 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 um, an offspring or an offshoot of uh, an earlier project, which was the Instruct GPT. Um, they could put, um, let's say, um, expertise or technical know-how from the Instruct GPT into the Chat GPT as we have it now. And um, the next question, under the still under the envisioning, is whether they considered inclusivity by putting people at the center from the beginning of the project. Um, our response was yes. Um, that's because of um, the approach that they used in putting up the um, and building the Chat GPT. Um, it, 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 it had um, an inclusive approach. And um, based on that, we made that um, um, choice. And um, also there's a question that has to do with um, having been, um, or being able to identify sustainability strategies for the envisaged AI solution. The, the, the answer we, we chose was yes, um, because um, we realized that, okay, this is a research preview, but to sustain it, they are looking at having a paid service so that they could scale and all that. So it means that even at the envisioning stage, at the planning stage, they've, they've thought beyond um, the beta phase or the, um, the research preview phase. And um, that is also um, a good sign when it comes to um, sustain, having sound sustainability strategies for your solution. And um, that brings those set of questions bring us to the end of um, the envisioning um, pipeline or the envisioning stage of the pipeline. Um, the next stage would be the, the, the data phase, right, where we have um, questions that relate to data, specifically the data. But one thing that I also have to um, bring up is that we have three main um, um, options you could select from. That is yes, in terms of responses, it's either yes, no, or I don't know. Um, and um, here you see some I don't know in there because some we are, we are evaluating a system that is not originally ours. So um, there's that tendency that um, whatever we do might not be too exhaustive. So at certain points, we try to use I don't know instead of a definite um, no and all that. But if you see no, then it means that we are quite certain of, of, of what we are talking about. Yeah, so when it comes to um, um, chat, OpenAI having um, data collection principles, specifications, and protocols in place, that one, we didn't really see much information on um, um, online um, that could help support this. So we chose we didn't know. And um, the next question also has to do with um, um, OpenAI having, a, or ChatGPT having proper data governance and control um, over um, personal or other sensitive um, data. 
um, we, were, we were kind of more skewed towards no because of certain um, things we were seeing um, in terms of um, us not knowing how the training is or how they use the data, the data that they collect from us, how they, they, they end up using it, and the fact that um, data that you delete is not actually deleted and all that. But um, to be on the safe side, instead of giving a definite no, that at this point we also um, decided to go with, um, I don't know. Um, since these are um, questions that um, not being part of the core team might might be very difficult to answer. We tried to answer some other questions, but would we would do that? So, in maybe for um, your case, if anyone wants to use the the, the um, assessment um, um, tool to to assess their 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 own applications, I'm sure you'll be having less of a um, little I don't knows or to even though I don't know in your your, your um, responses. So for the third question on the data, um, the question basically has to do with the um, source of um, the data used, whether it is known, right? Um, what we realized was that, okay, with the data that OpenAI um, ChatGPT is using, um, all that is reported is that they have, they took um, vast amount of um, coding data and other information from the internet and all that. But when it comes to the specific sources where we can go and 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 vet or verify, um, we do not have such um, information available. And and because of that, we chose a no for that. And um, also um, the next question that has to do with um, the data sets that they used also being publicly available. Um, the answer that we chose here is no, because we do not have access. No one has access, apart from maybe the core team, um, that has access to um, the training data and maybe the testing data and all that. No one has access to um, any data set that was 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 used specifically to train the chat um, GPT and all that, even though they talk about um, using um, data from diverse sources yes and um yeah the next question also has to do with um um the data um whether the data contains severe issues that could impact the developed um system um here the 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 the, the response or our answer was yes because we realized that okay some of this raw data, even though there might be some um, cleaning, pre-processing and all that might have some in um, 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 inherent biases and um, which which can can still go a long way to in, in, in inhibit or impact the um, the projects in the long run. So that's, that's, and also since we do not have access to um, the data to, to vet the data and all that, I think, um, that's that's what made us choose this um, answer as um, our response to that question. Then the next question also has to do with um, um, the data following acceptable standards, best practices and specifications for data development, like data sheets for data sets and all that. And um, here our response was, I don't know because um, you said that given the sources of the data and the specific data points that were uh, used in the training, right, and the fact that these ones were kept private, and um, we really do not have too much information on um, um, the training or the data that they used, and with respect to compliance and let's say standards that um, they try to adhere to or follow. It's, it's also very difficult to make such pronouncements, but um, we believe that um, for, for a firm like OpenAI and all that, there's that tendency of, of putting in place some um, um, level of, let's say, um, compliance or governance so that at least they, they do things um, in a in a in a right manner. But so to be safe, we just decided to go with I don't know instead of the um, the outright no. And um, for the data um, 
the next question also has to do with um, the data being self-contained. Um, here, we said yes, the data is self-contained because um, this um, the data contains a massive amount of um, data from internet conversations and all that, and um, which was used to to train that. Right. And the next question also has to do with does it link to or otherwise rely on external sources? We realize that um, here the data that they used to train um, it's doing training. They do not rely on other external um, data, right? So it's because we know that it's self-contained. So um, they do not rely on external data and that we chose no. And is the data anonymized? Because anonymity is very important, um, especially when you're dealing with um, human subjects and other stuff, ethical considerations. And um, here we also chose I don't know because um, as I stated el um, earlier, um, we do not really have a lot of information out there right, to, to um, explicitly, uh, explicitly like as in give us that information whether um, the training data was, was, was anonymized or not. Uh, but there's, there's, I'm sure there's a high possibility um, that wasn't taken care of in, in terms of um, anonymizing um, the data. But yes. That's, that's why, we, 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 to be safe, we went for the I don't know. So that brings us to the end of the questions that were considered under the data. So for the model aspects, we, um, the framework looks at um, maybe whether there are guidelines and specifications to facilitate reproducibility of the model. Because this is one key thing. If you come up with models that people cannot reproduce, then it becomes problematic. So we realize that okay, information available says they um, they employed um, the PPO, um, this reinforcement learning technique with the uh, proximal policy optimization technique. And um, once that is, is 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 available, it means that okay, there's some level of work that can be done to try and reproduce, right? But um, the next question that um, came up is um, um, whether traditional models have been evaluated um, for reference. And um, since it was based on Instruct GPT, Instruct GPT has um, been ex um, extensively evaluated for on some downstream um, um, NLP tasks like um, question answering, reading comprehension, and also text summarization and all that. So yes, the, the um, traditional models it stems from has been um, well um, evaluated um, on some um, down, downstream task. And um, the next question and the model also has to do with um, whether the model overfitted on the data. Um, the answer we chose was no, no, because um, looking at um, um, how the, the, the response or the feedback from um, the chat GPT when we interact with the chat GPT um, is, Yes, there's no way we could we could say that it overfitted because it's able to generalize. It's able to give us things that at least on uh, um, on a larger scale are uh, very accurate and all that. So that's um, the reason why we, we we chose no for an answer. And um, the next question, whether the model is dependent on specific features. Yes. So here, um, um, OpenAI is 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 dependent on um, the GPT-3. Um, language models and these GPT-3 language models are not open source. Um, so yes, it's 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 it becomes quite problematic if you want to um, try and create your own stuff. There are other um, open source um, projects that try to 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 look at what GPT-3 does, but GPT-3 is 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 not open source like that. So. That's why we chose um, yes. It's it depends on GPT-3, and GPT-3 is is something that you need to be able to what, create your own version of ChatGPT. And um, yeah, the next question also has to do with whether the model um, is an original idea. Here, the, we are saying that no, because um, ChatGPT is a build up on um, the Instruct GPT, which 
is the earlier um, um, platform, right? Just that there are, there are some few differences in um, some performance optimizations and maybe some security enhancements and all that in there, coupled with the human feedback that has been integrated into the chat GPT. But it's 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 not novel. It's it stems from um, um, previous projects that. Um, yeah, a previous project, that's the Shark GPT. And um, the next question also has to do with whether the model is based on um, a published research. Um, the answer is yes, because you realize that there's a base paper um, which has even been cited on um, their websites and all that. There's a base paper that's um, learning to summarize with human feedback by um, Stenon et al. Um, there's also another one by um, Gao et al, which is um, scaling laws for reward models over um, optimization. That is a relatively newer paper. So we, 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 we tried and based, or we, we based the, the, the work mainly on, or heavily on the, the Stenon et al paper. And um, that's, that's, that's that. And um, that feeds into the next question, whether the base paper has been appropriately cited. The response to was yes, because the base paper has been represented at, um, or has been presented, sorry, at um, reputable AI conferences and also cited by um, other researchers to support um, its, um, in terms of credibility and all that. So here, does the base paper have 10 plus uh, citations? Yes, it has more than, it has, um, I think, it has over hundreds and all that. So that's, that's um, that. And um, is the model, the next question is whether the model is tuned for optimal hyperparameters. That one too is yes. And um, we chose yes. And um, we say that ChatGPT is tuned for optimal parameters. and. That's, that's, that's that. Then we have the next question, which is whether um, the model is trained um, on a publicly shared data. Um, okay, here the response we chose was yes, because um, per the, um, the, the, the information we got, okay, it's, it's sourced from, from, but here in the same way, we could have gone no, or we can have gone, I don't know, since it is the data is not out there for people to, to, to use. But um, we thought that, okay, once um, it, it, it's, it got it from maybe public, um, somewhere in the public domain, like internet websites and all those things, at least that's what we thought, but not as one single data sets and all that. So that's why we chose yes. And um, um, with 11, whether the model architecture is publicly shared, for that one is a, is a no, right? Um, it, because one, we all know that um, ChatGPT is not available to the public. The, um, the architecture is not available to the public, right? And um, there's also um, one maybe because of the, the, the fact that they might, they, they, they have intentions of making it a paid service and all that, so they're not too keen about putting it out there. But um, and we, we once this is um, based on the Instruct GPT and Instruct GPT is out there, um, you can in a way say that it's partially out there, but it's it's not actually out there. So that's why we went with um, a no. Then the next question here is whether the results of the hyperparameter tunings, are they reported, right? So here um, we, we, the, we chose yes, um, and our explanation was that we have, there are some recent changes and updates to the model, right, which was released some months ago that show some parameters being reported and flagged um, um, when um, needed. And um, the next question, whether the models allow the use of explainable AI methods here, the option we chose was no, um, because um, it does not allow um, the use of um, explainable AI methods, right? So these are all um, gotten from the um, chat um, GPT or the open AI websites and all that, so, okay. So um, the next question under the model or the modeling um, stage 
is whether the models employ explainable AI methods. We already know that it's no. And um, does the model use an active learning framework? That one too is no, because um, what we realized is that um, the, the, the AI doesn't ask you questions um, so that it can learn, right? It's you doing the questioning and that um, the, the platform giving you the answers, but it doesn't ask you questions so that it's able to um, learn certain parameters or it doesn't query you so that it's able to learn certain parameters and all that. And um, because of that, it doesn't do any active learning and that 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 is, uh, is no. And um, I think the last question under the modeling phase is whether the model is published in the conference or a journal. Here it is no, right? Because to, our, to the best of our knowledge, um, ChatGPT isn't published in any um, conference or journal, even th though um, there are a number of um, journal papers or conference papers that talk about um, the, the qualities and, and let's say the exploits that chat GPT uh, um, presents or offers, but um, there's no official um, paper out there that um, explains or brings chat GPT to um, people in the research community or the academic space. So when you look at um, the final stage of the pipeline, which is the deploy stage, um, we have these questions, whether the lab, in this case, the organization, is capable of reliably deploying AI solutions or applications at scale. Yeah, the answer is yes, because they are partnering with um, Microsoft um, to um, help them scale their um, automatic or let's say artificial general intelligence um, um, platform that they have, um, that's ChatGPT. So yes, they, they are able to, there are considerations to be able to scale. Yes, and um, is there a human factor in the decision-making process? Um, the answer is no, and um, because um, this is not um, supported by um, ChatGPT, everything is quite automated. Right, so, and there are instances where um, human being part of the decision-making process is important. So in terms of, such, or in such application, you can have semi-autonomous um, 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 agents or systems, but for chat GPT, it's a fully autonomous, which has, and that has no human um, interference. Yeah, so um, the next question under the um, deployment is whether um, there are decisions made uh, or decisions are made by models analyzed at regular intervals here, yes, um, because there's also evidence from um, an article citing some real-time patching of um, compromised um, precautions and all that. So, um, from time to time, they try to, uh, excuse me, um, look at, re-look at the model again. Um, yes. And um, does the model learn from all the production data via active learning? That is no, because we already know that it doesn't integrate any active learning framework in there. And um, the next question that you have under deployment is whether infographs or um, graphs are used to convey the analysis of the production data. Here it is no, right? Because um, it's not it's not um, um, available. So this um, it's, it's evident because of the kind of interactions we have with it. We, we realize that okay, these things are not available for us when as we interact with the with the platform. Um, I think the next question whether the production data is anonymized um, here. Um, the, 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 the answer we, or the option we chose is yes, because here um, ChatGPT has made, um, the, we realized that ChatGPT has made some um, efforts to try and um, in a way um, create like a map of a sort between the data it, it, it receives. And um, they, they, after that, they try to discard the original data, but once once they ha have your data and they're able to um, um, identify patterns and all that, and maybe not link it to you or something, I think yes. So that is that is, um, and for for 
um, let's say clarity sake, um, I think some anonymized um, data parts came. I think that was data for training, and this anonymized data is data production data and not um, um, during the training phase of the model. It's once the model is in production. Okay. Then um, the next question under the deployment is whether the inference data stored for future um, is, is stored for future review analysis or mod, uh, modeling. Yes, we already know that ChatGPT stores whatever all the data that we feed to it. We know that. So and it's to help with future reviews and uh, um, especially since we are in the research preview stage, um, feedback for them is very essential. Yes, the next question also has to do with um, the inference data, whether the inference data is, 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 is analyzed. Um, here, the response is no. We are basing this on um, a tweet um, made by um, the CEO of OpenAI, um, which um, states that ChatGPT is yet to be retrained on new inputs since its release and all that. So that is um, why we... we we chose that option. The next question here is, is the inference data publicly shared? The response is no. Um, that, and also, um, there's a question on um, the prediction or whether the predictions are averaged using ensemble methods. That one is very difficult to tell since we do not know the architecture um, of ChatGPT. So it's very difficult to 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 ascertain whether it's 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 um, there's an ensemble in there um, helping with the prediction and all that. Yes. And um, the next question and the deployment has to do with um, the confidence score, whether the confidence score is considered in the decision of the model. Um, the, the, the selection, our option was yes, right, because um, we realized that um, there is some um, reward model implemented in um, chat GPT where it ranks models with responses by quality. So yes, we, yeah, that's, that's, that's that. And um, there's a question that has to do with the uh, model being able to predict every um, production data point regardless of the decision workflow. And we say yes, because um, it's quite obvious um, that every um, um, question we post to chat GPT, we get a response back, right? Just that maybe you might not be too com um, convinced with the answers or um, otherwise. So that's, that is a yes for us. And um, the next one is um, um, whether the um, chat GPT um, has um, a, a model in there to help explain um, its prediction, right? And um, whether this is also shared in a decision report. And um, that is um, a no because ChatGPT does, uh, does not use explainable AI methods. So, and um, we have um, a question that looks at um, the prediction confidence shared in um, a decision report here. Um, the prediction confidence is used or the a confidence is used during inference, but it is not shared publicly. It's not shared for people to to see. Um, so that that is a no for us. And um, okay, so what you can see now on um, the slide is basically supposed to be like a summary of um, all the the options we chose for the various stages in, within the pipeline. That's um, envisioning data the model and the deployment phase. And the um, 1 to 16 shows the, the question numbers. So um, that's, that's what we'll use to populate the platform once we visit the platform. Okay. So here, um, what you see on this slide is um, just a, screen, um, a screenshot or a snapshot of the, um, the chat GPT as um, we, we, we inputted our options. On, um, on there, um, we realized that um, for um, fairness, we had about 75% for accountability. There's about 100%, um, 100% for confidentiality, 100, um, 75 for ethics, 
than 100% for transparency and um, also 73% for safety. This is at the envisioning stage. So what, what this shows is that at, during the whole planning phase or the envisioning stage of the, um, the facets, uh, sorry, let's say the chat GPT, um, it was, everything was on point. Everything was really thought through. But if there are issues, the issues might come up during implementation or how people perceive the implementation of the, the application. So when we look at this side, that's the data, um, um, the scoring of the data, this is where the issue starts popping up. Um, for once, after answering all the questions here, realize that we have 100% um, for fairness, we have 0% for accountability, we have 33% for confidentiality, we have 25% for ethics, we have zero for transparency, and we have zero for safety. So this is, is, is a cause, um, um, it's, it's, it's something that at least we, we, we have to be concerned about because the, the aside um, the fairness, um, every, everything is, 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 is way below um, um, standard, right? And um, the next thing you are seeing on the slide, this has to do with the, the, the scoring for the model, the model stage. Um, you realize that at this stage we had 10% um, for fairness, 60, um, we had 10% for fairness, we had 68% for accountability, we had 0% for confidentiality, we had um, ethics 43%, um, transparency 46%, and we have safety about 65%. So this is better than the data stage, but it's it's it also has its um, flaws. Yes, and um, the final stage, which is the the deployment stage, um, after going through and answering all the questions that you can see here. Um, we have about 25% for fairness. We have 64% for um, um, accountability. We have 0% for um, confidentiality. We have 50% for ethics. We have 0% for transparency. And we have 58% um, for, for safety. So this is looking at the individual breakdown. But the whole facet as a whole has um, um, also a a, a particular score. So it means that the overall facet score is 54%. So, and what one thing about facets is that we're able to generate a badge for you, which you can you can serve in your um, on your platform or in your applications to at least help people um, know that you've 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 um, gone through the the the, the facets framework. Um, or you've been you've, you've you've been validated or verified. Your processes have been verified by the facets um, framework. Yeah, so that's what you see on there is the badge, which is still showing the 54%. So this 54%, what comes together to make up the 54%? It is 82% from the visioning stage, 10% um, um, being the, the the value that was scored for the data phase. We are 53 for um, the model and deployment overall had um, 47. So when you um, strike averages and all those things of, for this, um, this is, you have this um, um, value there, that's the 54%. And the overall um, fairness of the chat GPT was 48%. The overall accountability is 61%. The overall confidentiality is 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 five percent. The overall ethics is fifty six percent. The overall um, transparency is thirty two percent, and the overall safety is what um, forty eight percent. So that explains the the fifty four percent that we have there as the um, the facet score of um, the chat GPT application. So here, what does this tell us? It tells us that okay, fine. Um, when it comes to how responsible um, um, chat GPT is based on um, this um, um, assessment that was done, um, it's, 
it's, it's, it's, it's not too bad, but at least more work can be done. That's with the 54%. Um, during the planning phase, it's, we, we, we also realized that, okay, a lot of things were considered, a lot of um, um, considerations came up, um, nice considerations came up, which made them score higher um, um, marks under the envisioning stage, but where they fell short was the data stage, right? So it means that there are so many um, things that can be done right, right, um, with respect to the kind of their data. So um, the data they use in terms of their um, um, transparency, in terms of, um, let's say, um, how they, their governance or their data protection um, processes and 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 um, other um, things as well and for the deploy and um, model phases the, the 47 and the 53 percent yes it's 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 not bad but it can also be be, be improved on um, further right so I think this this is um, just bringing us to the the end of the presentation. I'll just take us briefly to the the web interface, where we can see the interface and see all the um, the scores moving as we feel and all that. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, just this. Just this. Just this. Just this. Okay. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Professor Jerry. Thank you, Dr. Henry. This was very insightful. We have a few minutes left and would like to entertain a few questions from the participants. Please, you can post your question in the chat as a chat, or you can request to speak and, uh, and speak, whichever method you would like to use. Any questions? Okay, but please, for the sake of time, I think I've shared the the link to the um, the platform in the in the messages section, so participants can have access to it and visit it themselves. Thank you. I'm accepting him there to speak right now. You're on. Thank you. Kiemde, you on? Uh, yeah, he has to unmute. Oui. Uh, hello. Hello. Yeah, hello, we can hear Bonjour. you. Uh, je, je suis Kiemde Elise depuis le Burkina Faso. OK. Uh, I'm... Uh, my name is Mr. Elise Kiamde. I come from Burkina Faso. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to I want to say uh, congratulations for Open Eye for, for presentation. It's very very important for us to to know. Thank you. And uh, if uh, we have uh, many or, or another opportunity to have uh, with me or other me, thank you and see you next time. Okay. <laughs> Eddie, I guess it's just a comment, right? I see a comment.
comment in the chat box from Betsy. How do you weigh the questions? Okay. Henry, you can pick that. Okay, so I think um, earlier it was discussed that um, the various pipeline sections have um, their weights. They have their weight. So that means that, for example, envisioning can go up to 30%. So it means that all the questions in there um, sum up to 30 irrespective of, of, of the weights that, that they have, right? And um, uh, it, was, it was the committee that sat on this, right? That looked at um, how a question affects, let's say, um, the fairness of it, the, 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 the accountability of that in terms of confidentiality and all that. So it was, it was based on the weights that was assigned by um, the committee that sat to, to look at this, right? But everything sums up to, to 100%. And um, there are instances where some questions can even have a negative impact on some principle. So in that case, we'll have to subtract. We don't always just add, we have to subtract. So at times you see that a yes or no can, can add to some principle, but also might also subtract from that um, another principle, but would not be higher than the weights that was um, agreed um, on by the, the committee or the group that looked at um, putting this together. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. And um, I think with this one too, with respect to the weights, we also um, relied on um, some earlier works. Yes, um, yes, we also relied on some earlier works. The group relied on some earlier works. So that, that's my response to this. Okay, I have accepted uh, the next speaker. Peter, please go ahead. We will give five more minutes. Uh, if you can stay, colleagues, that would be great. I see some positive comments in the chat box, which I will read after Peter will speak. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, Great. we can. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, so, so, so thanks a lot for the presentation on, on this um, quantitative approach to measuring responsible uh, AI, uh, which uh, relies on the facet approach. Um, I noticed on the platform uh, we do have vision data uh, model and deployment, and then obviously with different weights that leads to an overall score, right? Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, I mean, it depends on how far this, uh, the next step to building this particular uh, measure. I worked with uh, a group of experts um, to work on what we call the, the framework of classification of um, AI systems, because AI systems are not all the same, right? So um, understanding how best to classify these systems is also another way forward, right? Mm -hmm. So in classifying the ai systems obviously uh we also looked at i'll be putting it on the chat to see how best you can um include include this in the probably the next phase of this uh approach that has been uh been done i think it's the first of its kind so uh we have the economic context of uh ai system we have obviously the data and the inputs uh one of the things that is also very important to have people in the planet at the center, human-centric approach, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously the outputs and also the AI model, right? So um, the, the papers are open source, uh, it's open source, so I'll put, I'll put it on the chat to see how best uh, this great approach can adapt, can take into account some of these insights on the classification of AI systems, given that AI systems are not all uh, all, all the same. So, so that's the first main uh, remark uh, on that to see how best this can be uh, scaled up, right? So, so that's the uh, first uh, part. The second aspect is, I mean, making sure such work that has been done is uh, is made public. I think that's the essence of this communication mm -hmm. today. 
but uh, it'd be great if there's a lot of communication on this on this tool so that uh, you have more feedback um, on, 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 on that, right? So, um, and in a classification of AI system, we will also look at the sectorial applications, right? The mm -hmm. sectorial applications. So how do we adapt this quantitative approach taking into account uh, not only the uh, classification of AI system, but also the sectors of application of, of such AI systems, right? So, um, yeah, these are a few, a few, a few remarks on uh, the work being done, and I'd like to applaud the team for, for, for the good work done uh, so far on this initiative. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Yeah, uh, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Hello. Here you go. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah. The, the very good work uh, by uh, the, our two profs, <laughs> and I think uh, it's helping us become more responsible. Um, my my first insight into A was um, more about going through like who checks the checker, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to use the responsible AI platform to check other models, sure. but. Mm -hmm how can we kind of trust the suggestions this AI is given? And mm -hmm. I have uh, just one angle about, because a lot of people are saying, let's keep humans in the loop. So I'd say that for our two professors, that's uh, Jerry and Harry, it may be easier for them to use the tool um, to assess other models, but for other people, that will be a pain because we don't even understand the motive behind the questioning and other things. So I'm um, seeing the next phase of this to be how to train other people, how to best uh, get, get the maximum benefit out of the two. I think when the understanding comes to the common person, these two will be really, really up there that people can really use to adjudge it. And mm -hmm. one of the things I also found out about is, is the questioning lines. So. I cannot find certain things like open source and other things. So it goes to that whole, like um, that kind of paradox. So it's not absolute that all open source tools are responsible. And it doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that all uh, teams which are not open sourced um, are not responsible to, because when you're talking about military AI and other things, they are not, they are not open sourced. <laughs> Meanwhile, they, they are up to the core because they will have the Henry's, they will have the Jerry's, to check whether it's responsible for them. And I kind of think that if the questioning, the line of questioning can shift away from maybe um, the open source and other stuff to actual things, then I think it will be better because we have so many open source data, but of course they are not responsible. They are biased or other things. So I cannot see um, these are the lines I want to contribute. Yeah, but very, very fantastic. Uh, job making AI responsible once again. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much. Jerry, would you like to address? Because there's some messages in the chat box as well that I would like to read. No, I think it's uh, the comments are well taken. Uh, we will take the feedback and then look at it again and see how we can tweak the questions uh, to conform with what has been talked about but the feedback is very positive and we are grateful for that okay thank you very much uh, thank you very much prof so there's some um links in the chat box peter posted the oecd link i see that um i see it. cosmos uh, how can artificial intelligence help me to get climate change which is affecting agriculture negatively so you're going to take the comments right so um, now or would you like to address it later in the consequent correspondence uh, if, if there are if there are many we could pick them three by three okay great so let me see so uh, climate change how can artificial intelligence help mitigate climate change which is affecting agriculture negatively and then um i think that's the only question the other great talks many things well done great work team and link the report of OECD framework on classification on AI systems, which I'm taking a screenshot of and I will have it also ready 
So I think the only question we have really is that one about the climate change. Thank you. Yeah, so I will start and Henry will come in. I think okay. climate change that borders on the environmental impact of the solution. And uh, basically there are questions that um, one has to answer as far as the impact that the solution has on the environment is concerned. And so uh, that has also been factored in as far as the uh, framework is concerned. So through that, we are able to make a determination whether it is uh, the solution is positive to the environment or not. Henry, please. Okay. Um, so I think, um, Prof, you, you, what you said is, is, is in line, but um, you see, practically, um, AI, AI looks at more of um, predictive or um, yeah, predictive forecasting measures to help with um, some decision making and all that. All right. So at that level, at the climate change level, um, AI cannot stand alone. It has to work with other emerging technologies like um, um, Internet of Things and all those things. So that at least if it's greenhouse emissions, we know that, OK, fine, we have these sensors deployed on the field that are um, monitoring, um, sensing and transmitting these emissions. And um, also, uh, once these things get to us, um, we have these um, um, machine learning models or algorithms in there. Where that's where the AI kicks in to be able to um, come up with some, um, let's say, um, predictive models um, that at least can be used for um, decision making. Yeah. So I think it has to work with 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 um, other emerging technologies. So that's that's from my side. And if maybe I could comment on the classifications and all that. Um, yes, um, the classification is, 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 the comment from Peter was good. Um, and, um, but when you look at this, um, everything has, you look at things from a certain angle, right? And um, you realize, you even realize that one, you are looking at applications that um, people would end up using like more public than, 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 than personal. That has to do with um, is it contrast um, um, thing. So you're not looking at assessing how responsible military applications are, but if it's an application that's going to be used for, let's say, like this facial recognition, um, mass facial recognition of people um, in the city, then it's something that has to be um, assessed with respect to how responsible it is. And um, there's also the concept of openness that um, once it's open, it means that it's ac accessible by everyone and it can be assessed and, and um, validated by people. So that's why the whole concept of, of, of openness is, is now preferred over, over um, closed source um, systems, which is, is, is also preferred when you're looking at, um, let's say, commercialization, uh, commercializing your, um, your, your, your innovation is preferred. But in situations like this, where you have a lot of people going to use it, and um, it's you are looking at the social aspect of that social enterprises. Yes, we we, we really need to look at these um, openness and these responsible solutions. I think that's 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 also some um, comments on um, Contran. Uh, uh, is it Gontran and Peter's yes statement? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, I think I don't see any more messages. I am just seeing very interesting work. Kudos to the team. And uh, I will. I don't see anybody asking to speak now. I don't see any requests for speaking. If colleagues, maybe one last call. I know we've gone over time, but if there is an urgent um, request to speak, I am monitoring the box. So don't see it here. So I would give a word to our principal investigator, uh, Professor Jerry, to close us uh, okay. with this lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you, Eddie. And thank you for all colleagues who have joined us. The whole essence of this exercise is for us to apply the tool to the work that we are doing with the intended purpose of providing feedback 
so that one from our side we can improve upon the, the framework and make it better additionally for those of us who are using it it also offers us an opportunity to be responsible as far as our various deployments are concerned the final remark that i will make is that let us not be so focused on the scores um, there is the tendency that in our bid to score high marks in responding to the questions we may provide answers that are not accurate the, the whole essence is to um, adopt it and then use it as a mirror to check ourselves so it is not so much an issue of being forced to use it but being open and subjecting the work that we are doing to some level of scrutiny so that we can be better at what we are doing this is the first phase and the hope is that collaborating and working closely together we can get a system that is much much better and we all can use it um so continue to go to our page and then see what we are doing Follow us if there is something that you are also doing, get in touch and then let's create knowledge together and be able to push the agenda together. Thanks to IDRC and all our sponsors for how far you have brought us in this. We wish the various projects very well and look forward to meeting again sometime soon. Over to you, Anna. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we close this meeting. Uh, and we are looking forward to the consequent lectures and to our community discussions. We will figure out a way for more dialogue since there is a huge interest in the rail work and in the topic that both, both professors brought today. Thank you very much again. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon, uh, day and evening. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye.